So I'm Mark Chaffordini with GoSeeTalk.com, and this is Conductor Richard Kaufman. Hi. And um, I, you're a very busy man, so first of all, I want to thank you for And I really have to time. go now. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that busy. I mean, man's work is never done. Yeah, right. But um, <laughs> if I get my facts right, you're POPs Conductor Laureate with the DSO. You've done that for 14 years. Uh, you were with the Chicago, you're with the Chicago Symphony, and you're also the principal POPs Conductor for the Orange County Pacific Orchestra. Pacific Symphony. Pacific Symphony, I'm That's sorry. That's right, yeah. Uh, a lot of responsibility. So how do you fit it all in? Where do you start and what's your schedule like? There are these things called airplanes and they take you where you need to <laughs> go. Uh, unless of course uh, you're in Los Angeles and there's a tornado and you have to get to Dallas and, <laughs> and then you, they cancel your flight. Um, but uh, I, I love conducting and um, uh, I'm a violinist okay. and started out uh, playing in the studios and on film scores and uh, always loved uh, listening to the scores that I was playing on and also watching films my whole life, like you probably, mm -hmm. and uh, listening to film music. And early on, I, I, I really loved Beethoven and Brahms and Mozart and the rest, but I loved the music of Alfred Newman and Max Steiner and Bernard Herrmann and the rest and Roger and uh, Franz Waxman. So my my career sort of went along and I ended up working at 20th Century Fox and then I ended up working uh, at MGM for about 19 years supervising music and um, I was also conducting and so it was just natural that when people said uh, we'd like you to do a concert what would you like to do I would say well how would you <laughs> like to hear this you know music from Silverado and uh, Ben-Hur and you know and all that sort of thing so it just sort of began that way uh, and fortunately, audiences love motion pictures, and they love to hear the music of motion pictures um, without hearing the car chases, and without hearing the gunshots, and you know, and all the other uh, sound effects and all that sort of thing. So, um, I just I really love doing doing this and, and uh, sort of uh, bringing film music to the symphony orchestra world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Korngold, Eric Wolfgang Korngold said, music is music whether it's for the movie theater or the concert hall. So we're in both. Yeah, it's a very universal statement. It yeah, really covers exactly. it all. Yeah. So as a violinist, when did you start playing music? Seven years old. Uh, I was uh, outside playing uh, football, walked into my house, and my mother said, uh, this is Mrs. Hewitt. She's your violin teacher. <laughs> and I probably said, what's a violin? <laughs> and she was sitting there, and I started playing violin. And, and I loved it. And I loved it for strange reasons. I, I loved the music, but even more, I loved the camaraderie of other young musicians. Mm -hmm. And the idea that when you would play a recital, they took you to eat afterwards. And, and, my, and we had some pretty good restaurants nearby, and so I actually, I would be playing a recital at a women's club or whatever, and I'd be thinking about, oh, I hope we go to such and such, because they have these great cheeseburgers. You know? <laughs> so, uh, fairly <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> no, that's okay, you know. One thing leads to the other. And that's true. When I was about 11 or 12, I, I thought, wouldn't it be great to not just play the melody on the instrument, but also to sort of be involved in everything going on. So mm -hmm. I sort of badgered my teachers into letting me conduct. I had no idea how to conduct. You know, you wave your arms and stand on a box, and mm -hmm. you know, you have power over other human beings. And what more could a young guy want? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so that's what, uh, what I did, and then just kept on, on doing that through college, and um, you know, had some pretty good breaks, and uh, here I am. Okay. Well, as a, a violin, it's a stringed instrument. The, it kind of transitions to a multitude of string instruments, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Yep. Did you try anything else out? Did you play anything? I did. Um, when I was 13 years old, um, we found out that Warner Brothers Studios was going to all of the junior high schools in Los Angeles and asking them to send their uh, best percussionist woodwind players and brass players to audition to be in the movie The Music Man. Wow. And I played the violin. There were no violins in The Music Man. So I went to uh, Mr. Umber, my junior high school orchestra conductor, teacher, and I said, I need to, there's an audition on Saturday, I need to play a, a brass instrument. And he said, well, there's no way you can learn to play an instrument. That I said, I know that. The studio orchestra plays the music. I just need to know how to hold one of them. He said, well, I have a trombone. So he handed me a trombone and showed me how to do this and that. 
And uh, the following week, I was at Warner Brothers with all these other great musicians from the junior high schools. I couldn't play a note. I could, make, <laughs> I could do some kind of you know, awful sound. But I had red hair. And I could march. I didn't study marching. but I, mm -hmm. And I got in the movie. And I was in Harold Hill's boys band and the, and the music band. And then went on to not study trombone, but to learn how to play it a little bit. And as I you know, was discovering conducting and all, I, I sort of learned a little bit of piano, some percussion. You know, I know how the instruments work. I can't all play all of them, though. OK. Well, um, let's bridge that into composing music. When you're playing something and you, know, you understand the instrument, that's one thing. But if you're trying to write some music but you don't play the instrument, how do you, how do you put those two together? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not really a composer. I've written music and okay. I've written songs. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I think that it's one thing to know how to write a melody mm -hmm. and another thing to, and to write a beat and a rhythm. But to know how to, like an artist, how to take the colors of the orchestra, the palette of colors, how to use them as solos, two together, three together, all of them together, is really a skill that uh, is, it's very difficult to learn that, um, especially in film music, because once you've learned, once you write melody, and once you write the rhythm, and once you do the orchestration and the instrumentation and all the rest of it, and you know how to do that, then suddenly you're staring at a movie with no music and some empty manuscript paper saying, now what do I do? <laughs> and it's all about timings and all that. So, so I, I, in answer to your question, though, I think that the colors of the orchestra and how to use them is, is an art unto itself, okay. uh, even aside from writing melodies. Uh, and I think film composers have demonstrated that. Bernard Herrmann uh, in the movie Psycho <clears throat> it's only strings. It doesn't use any other part of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you take, of course, John Williams, you know, and yeah. uh, I, I was very fortunate to play on a number of John's films, and one of them was Close Encounters, the third kind. And we, hey, we, were, we had recorded some of the music one day at Warner Brothers, <clears throat> and we were dismissed. The orchestra was dismissed, but they had more to do. And as I was packing up my violin, I noticed five or six tuba players arriving. Okay. And I looked and I said, what is that all about? And I stayed and of course it was, you know, bum, 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 this whole fugue, which I sat there thinking, well, this is fairly inhuman. You know, how does somebody come up with that idea? And it was just brilliant. So knowing those colors and knowing, you know, how to use them is sort of the next step if you're going to write music, you know, even if you can write melody. Okay. Wow. That's <laughs> Long okay. answer to yeah, a no, short no, no, question. No, no. Just give me a, a second to process. <laughs> that's, that's okay. A, that's a lot. <laughs> well, let's move to your time at MGM and, and Fox. Mm -hmm. and that sound, and so by virtue of you living in LA at the time, right. you were you know, pretty close to the studios. Born and raised in West Los Angeles. When I was brought home from the hospital, I was just born, our house, over the back fence of our house was the Fox back lot. Wow, get out of here. And true. <laughs> and as a child, I remember I didn't see any films being done, but I remember at night there would be bright light where they okay. were shooting. Uh -huh. I remember that. And then we moved when I was about two or three years old, a couple of miles away. And um, um, my whole childhood was surrounded by show business. Uh, when I was in uh, Pony League baseball, uh, my coach was Burt Lancaster. And I, Billy Lancaster, his son, was a friend of mine, and we were all growing up together, you know, and all that. And then Billy Lancaster went on to write the screenplay for the Bad News Bears, uh -huh. sort of about our team. <laughs> so it was just like this spider web of connection. And uh, it, it was fascinating mm -hmm. um, to be a part of that in West LA. And I remember as a kid driving past MGM Studios. And, and seeing these walls and, you know, we, my parents would take us to movies and I thought, wow, what's going on behind those walls, mm -hmm. you know? And eventually my office was behind those walls. So talk to us about that. What's, what's behind the gates? A lot of crazy people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, you know, uh, I, I, I started at Fox first for about two and a half years. Uh, there, there was a movie being done uh, called Unfaithfully Yours with Dudley Moore and Armand Asante. Mm -hmm. And Armand had to look like a violinist, and so I was hired to coach him and maybe help him look like that, and Dudley Moore 
also. And so after I did that, the head of music, Lionel Newman, one of the members of the Newman family, mm -hmm. Lionel Newman, uh, called and, and he had a lot of television that was about to start, like 10 or 11 shows, and he needed help. And so I became his assistant. And then after about two and a half years, <clears throat> a man named Harry Loyevsky at MGM, was head of music at MGM. I had known Harry when I was a violinist playing on sessions for shows. I would get hired. And Harry and I would talk about um, musical theater and all of that sort of thing. Because Harry started out as Fred Astaire's rehearsal pianist. Okay. So Harry called me and there wasn't much going on at Fox after a couple of years. And I kind of, Lionel had assigned me to do a film called The Man with One Red Shoe. I had to teach Tom Hanks to look like a violinist okay. and Jim Belushi to look like a timpani player and Carrie Fisher looked like a flute player and David Ogden Starrs looked like a conductor. Looked like a conductor. But there really wasn't going to be anything after that. And I was panicking. My daughter was about to be born. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, uh oh, I'm in big trouble. Well, Harry called and said, listen, uh, the music coordinator for MGM is kind of in his 90s and couldn't climb the stairs to the dubbing stage. Are you interested in that, in, in the job? I said, well, I've, I've got a movie to do uh, uh, here, and then I've, I was asked by a composer to go to London and conduct a film score for him, and this was in July. And I said, so I really won't be free until like the end of October. He said, well, give me a call when you get back from England. So, August, like three months go by. I got back, no work, and I called Harry on a Friday, November 5th, 1984, and I said, well, I just want to let you know I'm back and everything, you know, just in case. And he says, well, when can you start? He had held the job open for me for three months, and I started the following Monday at MGM wow. as music coordinator for the studio, and then Harry retired and I moved in his position and uh, was there for about 19 years. Wow, that's tremendous. Yeah, and in answer to your question, on the other side of the walls at MGM, uh, it was exciting. It was a city. I mean, there was a barber shop and a couple of restaurants and a shoe shine place and a store and all this sort of thing. And sound stages, and of course, if you're a fan of motion pictures, to be on the MGM lot is like nirvana. Mm -hmm. And I would finish work late in the evening, and sometimes I would just walk by myself through the lot, the empty lot. And it was like, you really do start to hear the voices, Gene Kelly and, <laughs> you know, M Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland and Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, it's, it was really a magical place. And then it was sold to Ted Turner and everything changed. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so m everyone's trying to be an actor. Someone's trying to be a film personality. And there's only so many people who can make it. Is it even tougher for musicians to make it in Hollywood or to make their names known? I think... Any part of the business is difficult because there are a lot of people who would like to be doing it. Um, more and more the craft part of making movies has disappeared. Uh, if somebody, <clears throat> if you're an actor and you're in a big hit, then they will sign you to direct. Okay. Why would you be signed to direct? You know, I mean, it's just, I don't know. It, it's just very strange. It's like if you're on the street and somebody falls off a bicycle and you run over and you pull them over to the side and you know you run inside get some band-aids you put it on and somebody comes up and says oh well, you, now we'd like you to do some brain surgery next week <laughs> you know because you just helped this person mm -hmm. and and that's a, a radical example but but the craft of being a musician whether it's a studio musician or a composer or a music editor you know a music supervisor there's a lot to know Mm -hmm. And it begins with a love of the, the art form, with a love of it, so that you see movies constantly. You listen to every film score you can get your hands on for no other reason than you love doing it and you want to soak it in. Sure. When I was playing as a studio musician on, on the, uh, the breaks, the 10-minute breaks and sessions, there would be one a 10-minute break every hour, I would stay in the studio and I would go in the booth and stand in the back and listen to the director talking to the composer, watch the playbacks, and I just, I, I just loved it. Okay. And, and I think that today it's one thing to be able to compose music and another thing to compose film music because the whole technique of writing music, it's a whole other thing besides okay. writing 
you know, great music. There are a lot of, uh, although I would have liked to have seen what Mozart would have done if he had been given a film to do. That would have been pretty cool. It's, it's a wonderful question to ponder, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's difficult. There's a lot of competition. There are a lot of wonderful musicians to play in the studios and, and less work than there used to be. Mm -hmm. And film composing, a lot of people would like to be doing it. Um, and it's, it's, it's tough to do. It's really tough to do. Well, you've written some, s uh, if, if, if I understand this right, you've written some music for um, Pink Panther, cartoon mm -hmm. series, All Dogs Go to Heaven, and mm -hmm. even uh, In the Heat of the Night TV show. Yep. What's that like? I mean, with the amount of music that you've played in your past and the point when you get up to, hey, this is me on paper, where, mm -hmm. do, where, where does your personal preference lie? Can you have a personal preference when you're... As far as the music that I like or my job? Either one. I would, I never would want to be a composer full time. Okay. It's difficult to do. And how people, I mean, Elmer Bernstein once told me, uh, he was doing To Kill a Mockingbird, and he said they gave him the work print, you know, the film cut, but not scored or anything, or dubbed. And he sat for six weeks trying to figure out what to write. And, and he had done The Magnificent Seven, he had done, you know, all these great films. And so here's one of the great composers saying, what do I write? He finally told me, he said, he discovered that the point of view of the film was through the eyes of the children, Scout, and, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he wrote the melody, this beautiful little piano theme, and, the, and he, then he wrote the score. But it's really hard to do. And when I wrote, it was because of necessity. Um, <clears throat> if, there was, if the composer was running out of time and there were a couple of small cues, I would write them. In the heat of the night, the series we did, the Carol O'Connor series, we had no money for songs. And there, in the scripts, there were always songs in this jukebox at this club called Mason's Dixie Line Bar. Mm -hmm. and, and the script would say, you know, two rednecks fight over a woman as the music plays out of the jukebox. And I thought, well, we've got to have music. We don't, we don't have money to buy a song. So I, I started writing these country songs. I thought, you know, I'm from West Los Angeles. I'm a violinist. Why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally qualified. Yeah, sure. So I wrote a song once, a country song called My Love Gave You a Reason to Live, Your Love Gave Me a Reason to Die. I mean, is that a country song? Yeah, it sure is. I wrote a song once called I Love My Truck. <laughs> Doesn't get any more country than that. The lyrics are, <laughs> I'll tell you, some guys love their women. It's kind of a, an up two beat. Uh -huh. Some guys love their women, give them all they've got. Money, candy, hearts, and jewelry glowing in the dark. Dinners by the candlelight brings them lots of luck, but me, I am happy as a clam. You see, I love my truck. I love my truck. It takes me where I want to be, right up to the mountaintops and right down to the sea. Uh, it, uh, see, and if someday some woman goes and falls in love with me, I will look her in the eye and tell her lovingly that it takes me where I want to go and gets me back from there, takes me to the hardware store and to the county fair. Other guys may live their lives as lonely as can be, but me, I live, but me, I'm never all alone. I live in reverie. <laughs> I love my truck. It takes me where I want to be, right to, right to the mountaintops and right down to the sea. It, it throws my heart in overdrive and takes me to the stars, and it will never dump me for some crummy foreign car. <laughs> now, is that a country song or what? Well, my next question is, how much of that got in the bar scene? It played in the jukebox. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, the series went on for nine or ten years. A couple of years later, a script comes in my office called When, called the, when the Music Stopped. Mm -hmm. And Carol O'Connor had written the script. It was about a country western singer who accidentally kills his arranger and a guy who also helped him write songs because the guy felt that he needed to be paid and the singer hadn't paid him. Mm -hmm. And in the script, the singer, the character, sings all through the show in a club. One country song after the other. And we, hadn't, we didn't have money to buy songs, so I was talking with Carol O'Connor, and I, I said, what are we going to do, you know, for the songs? And he said, well, we've had a lot of songs for the jukebox. Um, what about those? I said, well, I wrote them. I can play them for you. Want to hear them? So I played them for Carol. Yeah, we'll use these. You know, I love my truck. It takes me where I want to. All these things. 
And he says, we're going get to some, get some really great country singer to, to do this. And I thought, I've got a whole new career. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have like Kenny Chesney or whoever, Tim McGraw or somebody, you know, uh -huh. they're going to sing these songs. So a couple of days later, the casting woman calls me um, in my office. And uh, Mary Jo Slater uh, was our casting person whose son was Christian Sl is Christian Slater. Oh, really? Anyway, Mary Jo calls and says, we've got the guy who's going to play the country singer. I said, great, who is it? She says, Robert Goulet. And I said, no, really, Mary Jo, who is it really? You know, Robert Goulet. I said, Mary Jo, come on, seriously. It's kind of, no, Robert Goulet, and he wants to hear the songs. I fly to Las Vegas to his house the next day. Now, Robert Goulet is not a country singer. He's no, a Broadway, Broadway you know. Yeah. And I think, what are they thinking? And I fly to Vegas, play the songs. These are great songs. Let's, well, this is going to be great. <laughs> fade out, fade in. We're in Atlanta. We shot the show outside of Atlanta. We pre-record the songs, and here's Robert Goulet singing, I Love My Truck. It goes in the show, all of it in the club scene. Excellent. He, Goulet calls me uh, a few weeks later and says, I've been asked to do, uh, be a guest on the Arsenio Hall show. Remember Arsenio Hall? Mm -hmm, yeah. Great talk show. Post. I want to sing I Love My Truck. Can you do an arrangement for five-piece band? Okay. <laughs> do the arrangement. He calls me a few months later. You know, I'm going back to Vegas to do my act, and I'm, I want to add I love my truck in the act. I need an arrangement for a 15-piece band. Okay. Wow. Again, so. I'm stupefied by that answer. Well, it's okay. It's just a... Uh... <laughs> While I collect my thoughts, let's, let's get... I mean, I could probably now just let you go on and on, but yeah, let's, let, let's get to while you're here. So, Casablanca. Casablanca. It's iconic. It's timeless. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a love story. It's, uh, it's one of the great... It's my personal favorite movie of all time. Many people feel it's the greatest, if not one of the two or three greatest films. How do you approach that? Max Steiner, he's done King Kong, he's done Treasure of the Sierra Madre, he's done tw um, 25 films a year. How do you approach something like that? My job is to lead the orchestra and recreate what Max Steiner did. Mm -hmm. Only the music is live. And so rather than hearing it in mono or even stereo, you're hearing it every single color of the orchestra, everything Max Steiner intended. Mm -hmm. uh, you, were, you were hearing what he intended. And, and I, that's the way I approach it. Um, it's very important that the audience see the film and, and understand the story. A lot of people have not seen Casablanca, believe it or not. And those who have may have seen it just on a small TV screen. Mm -hmm. Well, here they are seeing it on a big screen. And not only that, but here's the Dallas Symphony playing with score. And it's a unique experience. And so another part of my job is to make sure that there's the orchestra is balanced with the soundtrack so that people can hear the words. We have a great sound man, Russ Perdue, and he's going to be handling that. And so it's basically recreating what was originally done. As I told somebody, it's sort of like Casablanca on steroids. Okay. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's all bigger and, and you know, beautiful print, you know, for the film and all. And, and that's it. And uh, I mean, a lot of people absolutely, why do you love the film? You say it's your favorite film or one of you. Why do you, why do you love it? Well, Rick Blaine. I mean, Humphrey Bogart as one of the coolest anti-heroes. Right. Um, there's also the dynamic of how he fell in love with Ilsa, but she was sort of just, she was under different pretenses. I mean, she thought, right. she thought Victor Laszlo was dead. Right. She finds out he's, and it's, it's <coughs> a sort of, you know, going after something that you want, you think you have, but it's taken away, and mm -hmm. you know, it shows how fickle people are, how fickle love is. It's a, I mean, it's a cornucopia of right. themes, and yep. there, there's not one real reason, but, but save for this. When I was in high school, and I first saw it, my dad gave me the soundtrack, and I listened to it all summer. Wow. So I, I got nothing but Dooley Wilson singing, you know, um, Knock on Wood <laughs> and, uh -huh. uh, you know, La, La, Ma La Masa Yes, uh, that one scene towards the end of the film. And right. That just, like I was saying the, about how I just love music almost as, as much as the movie itself. Sure. It just kind of ticked in the back of my head. It, it brought themes that were on the, f on the screen so much more vibrant. Yeah. And that, that's one of the reasons I love it's because of the music. Yeah. as well as the themes. But what makes it, I'm interviewing you, <laughs> what makes Casablanca one of the greatest, if not the greatest film ever made? Because one of them, you've touched on a couple of things. First of all, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, mm -hmm. great actors. Uh, the story, the love story, there are several stories going on, mm -hmm. and the way they weave themselves together is extraordinary. Um, beyond Bogart and 
Ingrid Bergman, you've got a cast of the greatest character actors who ever played in Hollywood. Sidney Peter Green Laurie, Street, yeah. Peter yeah. Laurie, mm -hmm. Green Street, um, uh, S. C. Zakal, you know, whose nickname was Cuddles, which I thought. Yeah. And uh, Conrad Veit, or Veit. Um, and every single scene is like watching these masters of what they do. I mean, all the way through the film. It isn't like, oh, here's a great scene with Bogart and Bacall, or Bogart and, <laughs> and Bergman, and uh, then there's some other scenes. And here they are again. Mm -hmm. It's like every inch of the way. And then you have the cinematography in black and white with the shadows and, and the way they shoot it and the angles and all that sort of thing. Uh, you have the, the story, of course, of World War II and the mm -hmm. horrors that went through World War II. And people trying to escape it. That's why they're going to Lis Casa Blanca to get to Lisbon. So. That's right. Mm -hmm. And there's even the, in the scene where in the club the Germans are singing the national an their national anthem and then the, the patriots, the French patriots, sing uh, La Marseillaise. Yeah. And they shot it and several of the, in 1942, several of those people had experienced in real life what went on. And I had uh, read some really good accounts of how, when you see the tears on those people when they're singing in the film, those are real tears. Conrad Veidt was uh, incredibly affected by the Nazis. And here he is playing, you know, the bad guy, and yet his life was totally on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just really, really extraordinary. And then you take the music and add that into it. And if you take any of those elements out, it's, it, 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 I don't think it exists as Casablanca being, you know, this great, great film. My wife and I, you know, we, we've watched it from time to time, and every single time we say, you yeah, know, look, I never even noticed that before. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what he said? You know, so it's a constant discovery in that film. I completely agree. There's, there's actually one thing that, um, if you were going to take it out, it was what Max Steiner wanted to take out. He didn't like As Time Goes By. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, this you already probably know, but... Yeah. Well, no composer wants to have to use somebody else's music. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, the Colonel Bogey March, you know, um, when Sir Malcolm Arnold was writing the, the score for Colonel Bogey March, they said, uh, um, we're going to use uh, the, uh, um, the Colonel Bogey March. And so he actually wrote the Bogey March. And when you listen to the Colonel Bogey March in the movie, the French horns are playing this totally other melody that is the bogey, the uh, uh, the choir march, okay. and da 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 is going on, and you're listening, and you think, oh well, there's there he is, there's the composer, you know. But I think that what Max Steiner did was one of the greatest examples of arranging an orchestration and using a theme in the history of film, because when you hear what, how he molded that theme, her, the Herman Hupfeld theme, mm -hmm. into his score, it's just seamless. And it's really extraordinary. And I think probably deep down inside, Max Steiner was pretty glad he didn't have to come up <laughs> with such a great theme. <laughs> well, th there, are, uh, there are so many things that were already existing that he was able to weave into the score. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what you're, more you're speaking, what you're speaking to, is that it's, it kind of captured the, the mindset of the people right. of the era, and it was... It he kind of didn't have to come with it all up on his own, but he definitely had to put the pieces together. And it's that tapestry that, yeah. weaves, that lays over the whole story. If you it's listen to the film, there, there's something like 20, between 20 and 25 songs in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, it had to be you. I mean, it, it goes on and on. Every time you hear something, there's, there's another song playing in the background, putting its stamp on the time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, the music, the music's extraordinary in there. I mean. If you take the story and you look at the film without any music in it and somebody says, okay, we need a song that is for Bogart and Bergman that is their song. What touched them that brings them together? I mean, what a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know, and as time goes by, boom, just did it. It works. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, um, when it comes to points in the film, like when Dooley Wilson is playing at the piano, how is that going to be handled? Is someone going to play the piano and sing, or just? To keep the reality, we have left all of the source music in the film. Okay. Whenever Dooley plays, Dooley plays. Whenever the lady with the guitar is playing, she's playing. Um, <clears throat> when the band is playing Knock on Wood, uh, we, we have some strings that are, we've kind of put underneath a little bit, just to fill in a little bit. 
uh, but I think you'll be surprised what the orchestra is doing during Knock on Wood. Okay. And um, uh, but all of the source music is in there just as it was. Okay. Uh, if anything, other than the underscore, we add to it a little bit. Okay. Just, just, a, just a little bit. But still, as you said, it's going to be Casablanca on steroids. Absolutely. Uh, note for note. Um, and Dooley Wilson, by the way, he didn't play the piano. He was a drummer. Okay. And they had, a, they had a pianist on the set off to the side. And Dooley Wilson was kind of would look he, at him. He, he, okay. And now watch. that you're, you mentioned that, I kind of remember. It's sort of pantomimed. Yeah. yeah. But, um, well, another piece of trivia. Dooley Wilson was the only member of the cast who ever actually went to Casablanca. Really? Yes. You can amaze your friends at a party the next time you're with them. You I can will. win a lot of I, money I, with I that. I will say Mr. Richard Kaufman told me that. <laughs> Dooley Wilson has been to Casablanca. <laughs> well, um, so this is not your first time playing it. You've, you've taken this across the country and done this many I times. Did, I did this with the Chicago Symphony uh, in January and <clears throat> with Pacific Symphony uh, a few weeks ago. Um, in, uh, in Southern California. Okay. Yeah. As part of the, no, sh with Chicago, that's the Friday Night at the Movies. Right, a series we do with Chicago Symphony called Friday Night at the Movies. Mm -hmm. We're in our seventh or eighth year. Okay. We do three, three mm -hmm. nights a season. I will usually do two. Uh, John Williams will do one some of the time. Uh, we'll have other, you know, um, a composer come in or whatever. But uh, yeah, we, we we love that series. It's been sold out for seven years, and uh, we do all sorts of things. About three, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I did the entire Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. The whole score with the film, all two hours and twenty minutes of it. You know, daunting. it was it was daunting, and had a great time. Had an absolutely great time. But audiences love that, and I think when you have, you know, listening to music, it's also a visual thing. When you see the orchestra playing. And all that. It's an exciting, exciting thing to watch. And in a movie, to hear that music live, you know, or Casablanca or Wizard of Oz, you know, I've done, and, you know, it's, it really makes it extra special. Well, I think you'll enjoy it. And this orchestra, you know, it's one thing to play a symphony orchestra, another thing to be a, sym another thing to be a symphony orchestra that can play a film score. Mm -hmm. And with the passion and really, really getting into the drama. And this orchestra has always had that dynamic. So to do a score with them really is special. So I'm excited uh, for me because I get to hear them do it, and for the audience, you know, to experience the film that way with this with this orchestra. Well, then maybe I would I should get my tickets for tomorrow night as opposed to Saturday. Yeah, night. come on, you'll see something different every night. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks. This is great.